What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. So this is episode 65 in this series. We're still talking about video and in this one we're going to talk about the rolling shutter performance on the EOS R5. Now I have already published a super massive in-depth video looking at what the rolling shutter is, why it works the way it does, how it does everything, the math behind doing the calculations and stuff that we're calculating. If you're interested, it's almost a half hour long, or it's about a half hour long. I will put a link in the description below and a card above. However, if you're not interested in going that in de de detail on it, let me just summarize the what and the why in this video here. So what is a rolling shutter and why do we care about it? Ultimately, the way a rolling shutter works in a camera that uses one is that the camera reads out the sensor line by line from the top of the frame to the bottom of the frame. Now, because it's reading the sensor out line by line instead of as one atomic read for the entire sensor, it means that the time that the sensor is reading an image or the image data up here is going to happen at a different time from when the sensor is reading the image data down here. As a result, if something is moving in the frame or we're panning the camera, the position of the thing will move over the course of reading out the frame, and that results in a visual distortion or artifact. Specifically, this is typically seen as lines leaning to, vertical lines leaning to the side. So ultimately, as cinematographers, we care about rolling shutter performance because it affects how fast we can pan the camera without having obvious distortion problems, and how fast things can move through the camera, uh, through the field of view in the camera, without having obvious distortion problems. Now, one thing I do want to point out here before we go any further on this is that rolling shutter performance for cameras are not, is often not just a single number. So many times when you're looking at reviews of cameras, you will see them say something like, we measured the rolling shutter performance as X, or the rolling shutter time is X milliseconds, or whatever, and that's the only number they give you. However, well, I should say, for some cameras, that may in fact be the case, that they downsample everything from the full sensor readout, and there's just no other options for how the camera handles the rolling shutter. However, for most cameras, and certainly cameras like the EOS R5 and the R5C and so forth, there are various camera settings that affect how fast the sensor is read out and therefore what the rolling shutter performance is for the camera. So some examples of these things, the big one of course is resolution. It takes about the same amount of time to read out any given pixel or every pixel regardless of what you're doing with the camera. So if you have a higher resolution mode, say 8K versus 4K versus 2K, then it will take longer to read out the sensor information from the higher resolution mode than it will from a lower resolution mode. Usually, or at least that will be the case if the camera is using line skipping to arrive at the lower resolution options. So this is another factor that will affect rolling shutter performance. Is the camera downsampling or line skipping? In cameras that downsample all resolutions from one from the native sensor output, the rolling shutter performance will be the same for all of the output resolutions from that sensor resolution that the camera is set to. However, for cameras that are not downsampling, that line skip, which is something the R5 does in some modes, then the rolling shutter performance will increase, or it will improve, because there's less pixels to be read, therefore there is less time needed to read all of the pixels. Now the final consideration here is not something that we necessarily have control over, it's something that the engineers designing the cameras will control. And that is the balance between how much power the camera consumes while it's recording video, versus how good the rolling shutter performance is, and the ultimately, as a result, the image quality. So let me talk briefly about the test setup to just kind of flesh out all of the, uh, all of what I've done. I am using the flickering light process for testing my cameras, which means I strobe a light very quickly while the camera is recording video, and from the combination of the time that the light was on, the shutter speed the camera is operating, and the number of lines that are exposed in the bright bands from each test footage or each test clip, I can calculate the then calculate the rolling shutter time for the camera. 
So the control light in this situation is a custom built PWM controlled LED. It's set up so that it consume completely consumes the camera's field of view so that I'm not looking at anything uh, outside of that. I have the camera set up to record at its maximum shutter speed. In the case of the EOS R5, that is one four thousandth of a second. Though, if you saw my other video on this, it's probably more specifically one forty ninety sixth of a second on Canon's cameras. I have my camera set to record in C-Log3 using all eye compression. Uh, now the C-Log3 part is not specific or especially relevant. You can use any of the picture styles for this. The all eye part is important. So all eye compression has no dependency on other frames. Every frame is compressed as a completely standalone frame. Therefore, I don't have to worry about the camera interpolating temporal compression from frame to frame to frame. Now you could, in theory, do this with RAW. However, on the R5, you can only shoot RAW at 8K, at least record it internally. You can record it externally in both 8K and 5.1K. Uh, that would be an interesting experiment to look at. However, uh, decompressing RAW, either Canon's RAW format or ProRes RAW, is a bit more challenging using open source tools, which is what I have built the software that does the calculations, uh, the ultimate calculations for this process around. So using a regular compressed video format, in this case uh, H.265 in an MP4 container, makes things just a little bit easier for the post-processing side of this. Now, for my own edification, I wanted to see if the camera had a different performance or different rolling shutter performance for UHD versus DCI resolutions. So I did all of the tests, or I tested both UHD and DCI resolutions at all of the applicable settings. So 8K and 4K, where the camera offers those two aspect ratio options. Now for the test setup specifically, for each resolution in question, or for each test, I should say, I shot a five second clip. So I averaged the bright, the number of lines in each bright band across a whole number or a number of frames in each clip to account for timing inaccuracies or just measurement inaccuracies or, or just something weird happening. Five second clips result in 120 frames for the 24 frame per second content and 600 frames for the 120 frame per second content when it comes to averaging out, which I think is pretty, uh, super good enough, let's just say, for the, uh, to get an, a reasonable answer. Now on top of that, I tested five different light pulse times for each of these camera settings. So five seconds times five pulses times 14 different camera settings. It ends up, I tested something like 70 something camera settings, the, or 70 something test clips. The pulse times, are there to average out errors in calculating the shutter speed. I'm not 100% certain that Canon's using a 4096 or a 4000th. Trying to figure that out with any mechanism that I've come up with is kind of circular, so I'm not able to be 100% certain. But if I vary the time that the light pulse is affecting the number of rows, that can work to compensate for small errors in figuring out what the shutter speed is. So with that, all of the background stuff there said, let's get to the meat of this and talk about what the rolling shutter performance is on the EOS R5 and what you can, should know about it. So we'll start with shooting full frame in HK, 8K or 4K high quality. The rolling shutter time is 15 milliseconds. Now, Obviously, 4K high quality mode is 8K downsampled to a 4K output. Canon has said this. So from the camera's perspective, it is reading out 8K in either, either modes. And it makes sense that we should see the same rolling shutter time there for downsampled image. Dropping the, res or the image quality down to 4K standard quality and 1080p while shooting in full frame reduces the rolling shutter time to 9.3 milliseconds. So this strongly implies that the 1080p footage that you might be shooting on an R5 in full frame mode is downsampled from the 4K footage, standard quality footage that it is recording. Now, 4K standard quality is of course line skipped from the 8K sensor uh, output. 
So that explain or that we see that obviously in the difference in rolling shutter time here as well. Now, why isn't the rolling shutter time half? Good question. In theory, Canon should have been able to push it down to half, and in fact, they do in high frame rate mode. Uh, however, in normal frame rate mode, the choice here may simply have been power consumption. As I said, the faster you read things, the faster, the uh, less time the ADCs have to settle, the higher, more, more power everything has to use to process it. So the trade-off here may have been made to uh, ease power consumption, or if we jump over to APS-C mode and we look at what the 4K output is there, its rolling shutter time is also 9.3 milliseconds. Now, 4K in APS-C mode is downsampled from the sensor's full 5.1K resolution when shooting in APS-C movie crop mode. However, we would expect that this would possibly be a different rolling shutter time because the number of pixels being read out is different. Alternatively, as I said, Canon can control what the rolling shutter performance will be by setting how they time the, the release of each individual line. It may be that Canon decided to make these both the same so that you could intercut between 4K full frame and 4K crop footage and have the same feel. So with the same rolling shutter time, both of those modes will have the same visual look. Now dropping the resolution in APS-C down to 1080p reduces the rolling shutter time to 5.8 milliseconds. This is clearly line skipped instead of down sampled. However, in doing the math, again, assuming I did it right, uh, line skipping from 5.1K gets you about 1.3 or 1300 vertical lines. So that would then be downsampled to the 1080p output. So we actually do get a good quality image. Uh, one of the problems with line skipping has historically been uh, that the camera art cameras don't line skip to a high enough resolution. Uh, so for example, on a 5D Mark IV shooting 1080p full frame, the uh, line skipping produces like a 900 pixel uh, file uh, vertical resolution, which is then uh, scaled up to 1080p, so you don't actually have 1080p worth of resolution. However, on the R5, the way the sensor works out, this should be higher than 1080p downscaled to 1080p, so you should still get good quality here. So all of these were for your standard frame rates. This would apply for 24, 30, 60 frames per second in NTSC and 25 and 50 frames per second in PAL. For the last thing I wanted to look at is what does the camera do at 120 frames per second? So in 4K 120 and 1080p 120, when shooting in full frame mode, the rolling shutter performance is 7.6 milliseconds. So the rolling shutter time is 7.6 milliseconds. So this is obviously faster than 4K standard quality, and it is about half of what you would expect from looking at the full resolution readout. Now, why does Canon not do that for 4 points, or 4K standard quality in 1080p? Again, I think it has to do with power consumption or image quality. Dropping down to APS-C, there is also a 120 frame per second mode, though the resolution is limited to 1080p. In this setup, the camera's rolling shutter time is 4.7 milliseconds. So the best performance that you can get out of the camera is going to be at 1080p 120. Now, how can you make use of this uh, information or why would you want to care about all of this in your productions? So one place you might care about this is if you are shooting action sequences in a broader indie film. You may want to shoot your slower paced dramatic footage at 4K in high quality mode with the slower rolling shutter speed, but you're getting the benefit of full down sampled image quality. And since everything is generally slow paced in a more dramatic scene anyway, that means that you won't necessarily have a problem with rolling shutter distortion and you won't have high paced or fast paced action and motion blur sort of masking the resolution gains that you can get out of it. However, when you switch over to shooting an action set piece, the slower rolling shutter speed of 4K high quality is going to lead to more distortion. So for those situations, you would switch to 4K standard quality with the faster rolling shutter readout, 
and then shoot your action speed that way. Now, yes, shooting in 4K standard quality with line skipping isn't going to give as good of an image as shooting in 4K high quality, which is 8K downsampled. However, with fast-paced action, there's going to be more motion blur involved, and that motion blur is going to mask a lot of the resolution in the video as it stands. So, the loss of some maximum resolution is not going to be as noticeable or obvious. However, the higher or the faster rolling shutter performance will make the scenes look better from a rolling shutter distortion perspective. Likewise, if you're doing mathematical measurements or scientific measurements or something where you're shooting at 120 frames per second and you need more precise uh, alignment of information in the frame, shooting in APS-C mode gives you the fastest rolling shutter readout that the camera is capable of versus shooting at full frame mode, so you might want to make that decision instead of shooting in full frame. Now, of course, if you're shooting in 1080p for content, uh, the same kind of considerations apply as they did with the high Q, uh, 4K high Q versus standard quality. Uh, simply shooting in full frame gives you a better quality, but a slower rolling shutter readout. Dropping it down to APS-C gives you higher rolling shutter performance. Now, before this, I wrap this up, I do want to put a sort of a note out there. I am currently working on a safe panning speed calculator based on rolling shutter performance. So the idea is, is that at least as things stand now, for cameras that I have comprehensive rolling shutter performance data on, you will be able to plug in a focal length, a crop mode and resolution, and be able to, the calculator will tell you how fast you can pan for various amounts of rolling shutter distortion. So for example, 1% or one degree or barely noticeable or something to that effect. And so you could use that for your planning purposes in putting together a video. If, you th if that sounds like something that you're interested in, please consider subscribing to get notified when that happens. I will have a video on that. It should be coming in the next few weeks. I've already started writing it, so most of the problem right now is making sure that it corresponds accurately with the camera data that I have. So that's it. I would say that it's rolling shutter performance on the EOS R5 in a nutshell, but actually this isn't just a summary. This is the complete picture of what's going on with the camera. So if you found this useful or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.